So our next vignette is a 62-year-old woman who was drinking her morning cup of coffee at the same time she was applying her makeup and she noticed in the mirror that there was a lump in the lower part of her neck. It was visible when she swallowed. She consults you for this and on physical exam you ascertain that she indeed has a prominent 2 centimeter mass on the left lobe of her thyroid as well as two smaller masses on the right lobe. They are all soft and she has no palpable lymph nodes in the neck. They may also give you a slightly different variation of this case. It might give you a 21-year-old man who was found on routine physical exam to have a single 2 centimeter nodule in the thyroid gland. His thyroid function tests are all normal and an FNA reads as indeterminate. So the question is, what do you do with the incidental finding of a thyroid nodule? So we have to start with some fundamentals in terms of understanding how to work these up. So the first thing to do is to realize that if the patient is euthyroid, so that is that they're not having signs of obvious hyperthyroidism, you must exclude cancer. It's very unusual for a hyperfunctioning thyroid nodule to be cancer. But a patient who has normal thyroid function, certainly presenting with a nodule, could have cancer. An FNA is going to be the test of choice. So regardless of what's there on the exam, any other kind of biopsies, any kind of tests or scans, any kind of lab and abnormalities imaging, the FNA is going to be the test of choice. Why is that? Because it's going to be the most definitive way to actually get some tissue and make a diagnosis. If the FNA is benign, then no further intervention is needed, again, in a patient who is otherwise euthyroid. If, however, the FNA shows malignancy or is indeterminate, that being that they can't make a definitive diagnosis based on the FNA, then you need to do a surgical resection, a lobectomy. In the case of the malignancy, the lobectomy is being done for cure. In the case of an indeterminate FNA, it's being done for further diagnosis. Now, if follicular cancer is identified, either by frozen section or on the final pathology once you get the results back, many surgeons will take the patient back for a total thyroidectomy. And that's because with follicular cancer, there's a higher incidence of there being disease in the contralateral lobe. So again, just to recap, when you have a thyroid nodule, especially in a youth thyroid patient, a patient has no signs, no symptoms on clinical exam, on history, or on the blood work of being hyperthyroid, on a youth thyroid patient, your test of choice is going to be an FNA. FNA is even going to be your test of choice above ultrasound, even though that's something that would be done. But if you had to pick one choice, one choice, FNA is going to be the, the choice that gives you the most information. If the FNA is benign, nothing else needs to be done. If the FNA is indeterminate, you need to do a lobectomy for further diagnosis. If the FNA is malignant, then you're doing your lobectomy for treatment. Now, if you know that it's malignant and it's a high-risk lesion, you might opt to do a total thyroid. However, if it's an indeterminate, where you're only making the diagnosis on frozen section that there's cancer, then the option of doing a total thyroidectomy will be based on the final pathology findings. This is a little bit more advanced than I think they'll ask you on the exam, but in case if they go there, I just want you to have some principles and foundation to answer a question like that. Our next case is a 32-year-old woman who has a thyroid lobectomy done for a 2 centimeter mass that has been reported on FNA as a follicular neoplasm, not otherwise specified. So again, they're not quite saying it's follicular cancer. They're saying it's a follicular neoplasm, some kind of follicular growth. This could be a follicular adenoma, which is benign, or a follicular adenocarcinoma, which is cancer. The specimen is given for frozen section to a pathologist with a great deal of experience in thyroid disease and in the reading of frozen sections. The intraoperative diagnosis comes back as follicular cancer, so a follicular carcinoma. So what should be done in this case? In this case, a total thyroidectomy should be completed because, as I said before, with these follicular lesions, follicular cancers, there's a higher incidence of there being undiagnosed disease in the contralateral thyroid lobe. Also, the total thyroidectomy helps with the surveillance and management of these patients following surgery. So here's another case. You have an automated blood chemistry panel done during the course of a routine medical exam that indicates that an asymptomatic patient has a serum calcium of 12.1 in a lab where the upper limit of normal is 9.5. Repeated determinations are consistently between 10.5 and 12.6, and the serum phosphorus is low. So what we have here is we have a high serum calcium in the, in the face of a low phosphorus, and this is a classic for hyperparathyroidism. So now most commonly, most patients with hyperparathyroidism are relatively asymptomatic. However, they can have the classical symptoms, the stones, bones, abdominal groans, psychiatric overtones. These patients will all, though, have a high serum calcium and a low serum phosphorus. The diagnosis can be confirmed by getting a serum PTH level, and that would be elevated in a patient with hyperparathyroidism. Once you've confirmed the diagnosis, you now have to decide where is the abnormal PTH coming from, where is this being secreted from, and a SESTA-MEBI scan is going to be the scan of choice to locate the abnormal parathyroid gland. Once you've located the gland, then you can treat the patient by surgically removing the parathyroid.
So again, the order is confirmation, localization, and then surgical resection. A 32-year-old woman is admitted to the psychiatric unit because of wild mood swings. She is found to be hypertensive and diabetic and have osteoporosis. She has not been aware of such a diagnosis beforehand. It has also been ascertained that she has been amenorrheic and shaving for the past couple of years. She has gross central obesity with moon faces and a buffalo hump. She has thin, bruised extremities. A picture from three years ago shows a very different person with a more normal appearance. So this is kind of an extreme presentation. It has all the classic signs and symptoms, but points to the clues that you should be looking for for this diagnosis. Cushing syndrome has a very typical presentation. Patients present with round, ruddy hair, hairy face, buffalo hump, central or truncal obesity, abdominal stria, thin, weak extremities, osteoporosis, diabetes, hypertension, and menstrual instability. Now, that's not to say that every patient with Cushing's syndrome has every single one of these presentations, but when they start to give you some of these, especially in combination in the vignettes, they're trying to paint the picture of a patient with Cushing's syndrome, and you must be able to recognize that. As I mentioned, there's different ways of approaching this. At Mayo Clinic, they collect the 24-hour urine-free cortisol, and again, if it's normal, it rules out the pathology. However, if it's elevated, they then look at the ACTH level. If the ACTH level is elevated, then you know that has to be coming from the pituitary, so you have pituitary microadenoma. Whereas if the ACTH level is not elevated, in the setting of increased 24-hour free cortisol, then the source must be coming from an adrenal adenoma. And again, the next step is going to be localization, MRI, CAT scan, you identify the lesion, and now the patient can undergo surgical removal. Our next case is a 28-year-old woman who has virulent peptic ulcer disease. Extensive medical management, including eradication of H. pylori, fails to heal her ulcers. She has several duodenal ulcers in her first and second portions of the duodenum. She has watery diarrhea. So what we have here is a very very virulent case of ulcers, very atypical in the sense that she still has ulcers despite being treated for H. pylori. The ulcers are in abnormal locations. It's not typical to have ulcers in the first and second portion of the duodenum. And she also has watery diarrhea. And these are all signs of gastronoma. With gastronoma, you're going to have very aggressive or virulent peptic ulcer disease that's resistant to medication therapy, including therapy for H. pylori. Patients have several ulcers. Ulcers are setting beyond the first portion of the duodenum and often have associated watery diarrhea. The other term for gastronoma is the Zollinger-Ellison syndrome, but we'll go with gastronoma because we're moving away from the eponyms and towards the, uh, the standard nomenclature. So how do we diagnose a gastronoma? We get a gastrin level, followed by a secretin test if the values are equivocal, and then a CAT scan to localize the lesion. So again, it follows the same principle of confirmation, localization, and then surgical treatment. Now, in some cases, if the gastrinoma is metastatic, obviously surgery is not going to be amenable. For those patients, we put them on proton pump inhibitors. Our next case is a second-year medical student who's hospitalized for a neurological workup for seizure disorder of recent onset. During one of the convulsions, it is determined that the blood sugar is extremely low. Further workup shows that he has high levels of insulin in the blood with low levels of C-peptide. So our job is to figure out what this is. Okay, so what we have to be thinking about here is the possibility of insulinoma. Now, insulinoma we've seen with hypoglycemia, especially with fasting patients, but we have to be careful to differentiate this from other things that could also cause hypoglycemia. For instance, there's reactive hypoglycemia, which can be seen after meals, and also self-administration of insulin. So how do you know if you're dealing with a true insulinoma and endogenous production of insulin versus self-administration of insulin and exogenous production of insulin? The differentiating factor here is going to be C-peptide. So I want you guys to remember this. In cases of insulinoma, the C-peptide is going to be elevated. So if you see a patient who has what looks like insulinoma but has a low C-peptide, then that is going to be self-administration. So this case, although it has all the signs and pictures of possible insulinoma, is actually a case of self-administration. We know that because of the low C-peptide. Now, if this was a case of insulinoma, the next step in diagnosis would be a CAT scan to confirm the lesion in the pancreas because that's where these lesions occur, and the treatment would then be surgical removal. Our next case is a 48-year-old woman who has severe migratory necrolytic dermatitis for several years, unresponsive to all kinds of herbs and topical agents. She is thin and has mild stomatitis and mild diabetes mellitus. So this would be a case presentation of glucagonoma. The key thing here is the severe resistant migratory necrolytic dermatitis. You see this in patients who have glucagonoma. The patients will also have diabetes, they can have signs of anemia, they can have glossitis and stomatitis, but again, that migratory necrolytic dermatitis is going to be your main clue. 
So how are you going to confirm your diagnosis? You're going to do your glucagon assay. You're going to localize any abnormalities with a CAT scan. And then again, just like all these other endocrine tumors, once you've localized the disease, you can treat the patient with surgical removal. This is another disease where you could have metastatic disease that's not amenable to surgical resection. In those cases, patients can be treated, or at least palliated, with drugs like a triotide and streptozosin.